This is episode number 422 of the Health and Fitness Podcast by us here at Inner Fight. Brought to you in association with Smith Street Paleo, delivering paleo meal plans since January 2018. <laughs> <laughs> we actually established 2016 the business. Obviously, it's my business, guys. Don't worry about that. But they do support the show. We still have that offer. If you rate and review the podcast, you will get some Smith Street Paleo goodies. I'm actually really surprised how many people don't know how to rate and view a podcast. Yeah. You can do it on your laptop or you can even do it on your iPhone. Just go into the podcast app. Yeah. And we've even put in some instructions on how put to do that. some instructions. And we're actually going to spend another 30 seconds to start the show. You can flick forward if you want. There's a button on the podcast app that you can avoid this bit. Please don't. Please listen to what we're saying. Please just hop over to iTunes. What we do here is we're trying to share as much knowledge as we can. We obviously want to win on the iPhone tunes charts of podcasting so we want to go up so please as andre said within the app you can just go in and you can rate the podcast you can review it if you don't want to review it if you don't want to say anything just give us a five star rating and get the hell out of there what it does is it helps us to go up the podcast charts and maybe maybe one day after 400 and something shows, we might get paid a penny for spending the time to bring you these shows. But that's not the purpose anyway. That's not really our purpose, guys. It's fun. We have a lot of fun, and that's actually why I started the podcast. We spoke about that in a podcast before. Talking about podcasts that we've done recently, mate, some of the bigger hits a few weeks ago, Tom Evans in Podcast 416. I know you love that show, didn't you? I must listen. I yeah. must listen. If you're into sports and you want to know how to excel in sports, it's definitely a podcast to go give it a listen for sure. And then something a little bit different, but it definitely appealed to a lot of people. Carly Rothman, the lean living girl, the life of a fitness blogger over here in Dubai in 418. That was also a good show, but one that I loved, I know you loved it, was actually last week's show, mate, with Muhammad al Qasimi, number 420. Yes, man. Inspiring story. You should <laughs> definitely an, go hit that up. It's an insane, it was an insane show. 235 kilos down, 100 it's, kilos. That's crazy, man. Not too bad at all. 100 kilos and counting. All of your good hard work. Today, mate, we're going to hit a topic that actually has been something that the listeners have asked for. So we do listen to you guys, and we do really appreciate what you send us, whether it's through Instagram, whether it's just through outright abuse in the gym of topics. This is your show. We want you guys. If you have something for Andre, hit him up on Instagram at Andre Hude, or hit Boom. me up as well, MJD underscore Smith, and we will get these topics. Heart rate. Bang, a big one, man. It's huge. It, it, let's just plant a foundation for it mate have we or haven't we seen in the last 12 months an increasing number of people wearing heart rate watches monitors call it what you want it's crazy it's it's a new trend that started <laughs> and and why yeah i think this is what we're going to be talking about yeah because the reason why many people are using this because it's another way it's a new gadget it's a new piece of equipment and we all love you know <laughs> buying new stuff absolutely and it actually gives us a valuable data regardless almost of which sport you're in yeah now we're mainly talking about crossfit and endurance sports yeah because that's what we specialize in here um what do you think the purpose of this or how has this big trend started that that's when i was thinking about the show and obviously put like thinking about putting it together that's what i was trying to think and what I, and we've touched on this in, in previous shows as well, mate, we, when, you know, in, in, in shorter segments and in a three-minute show as well. When I think about heart rate, when I was 13, when I turned 13 years old, when I was running cross-country, is when I got my first heart rate monitor. And I remember it so incredibly well, mate. It was called the Polar Favor. Yeah. It was a small round watch with a belt, and all it did was give you your heart rate live it didn't do an average it didn't do a max it didn't do a minimum it didn't tell you the time it didn't tell you how long you'd run for but it was i was very keen on cross country at that stage actually the following year i went to england trials for cross country as well so i, I was pretty into it and this device gave me a motivation that i'd never had before because i was able to measure my effort yeah 
the highest, the best I got was 213. Boof. <laughs> Do you believe in that measurement? Now, 220 minus your age? Because <coughs> this is... Yeah. So nowadays, what most people use is to track them or to measure what their max heart rate should be. They take 220 and minus their age. Yeah. But me personally, I've never been up there yet. Yeah. I, I do think, and, and this is where I sort of want to get to with this show, mate, is that there's certain guidelines and there's certain percentages and figures that probably do apply for the mass population. Yeah. However, there are going to be anomalies to that. I was reading an article the other day about a guy, David Labouchere, who lives locally here yep. in Dubai. He was at Inner Talks, gave a fantastic talk. Prior to his recent Ironman, his resting pulse was 30. It's, it's freakishly low. Yeah. Like, it's incredibly, incredibly That's low. That's crazy. You, we, we see through, through, obviously, through your side, through more of a CrossFit side, through a lot of the endurance stuff that I'm looking at as well, we see some athletes, like, unable to push their heart rate above 160, whilst we see other athletes that are... 30 years old that are able to run consistently, you know, intervals of six or 800 meters at 190. Yeah. So there are quite a few anomalies, but I think the science is almost, if I, if you could call it that, like not, someone didn't just go 220 minus your age. Like they did testing and testing and yeah. testing and testing and testing. And so I guess they need to come out with some generalized numbers that the mass population can use. Exactly, mate. So, do I, do I believe in it? Absolutely, yes. Do I also believe that we have to test individual athletes to see what really their threshold is? Yes, we do. And I think that's where, that's where we, these devices are more than just like one time. They're, you know, chuck it on in the morning and figure out what your resting pulse rate is because that's going to be super important to us. Yeah. And um, put on your band, the chest band, put, not only because the watch. Is, yeah. I mean, this is a big, this is a big one. A lot of us yeah. only use just the the measurement that you get from the watch for the wrist. Yeah, and really, it's very unprecise. Right. Um, like I can do a workout and be like at 100 beats per minute. Yeah, and then I smack the belt on, and I'm like 180. Yeah, it's the the wrist, and actually on the radio show just earlier, we we're talking about that as well. The I I. I want to believe that the wrist heart rate data is accurate, but I, it's proving otherwise. I have, uh, in, on, on this watch, and <coughs> excuse me, we'll talk about some of the models that are available and, and stuff, we'll go into that. But on this watch, I have the wrist heart rate. It's a Phoenix 3 HR. It has wrist heart rate. I use it and I put it on as tight as it's supposed to be to get an accurate reading. And I actually use it for all of my strength training. And the heart rate is way off. Like okay. it, 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 it is way off. And I, I've tested it against the belt. So I've had this watch. I, I also have the same watch without the, um, without the wrist one. And I've had the belt on and I'm testing it. I'm looking at it and there's massive discrepancies there. So I think that's one of the biggest things, mate, is that if we're going to get super accurate data, it, like you say, it should come from that belt. So if you're using your watch, you might as well use the belt. Yeah. Like without it, it's almost pointless. This is the thing. Now, the companies are a little bit, I think they're a little bit sort of savvy to, should we say, people know that they they should have a heart rate device so garmin and the likes have maybe come in a, into the marketplace maybe a hundred dollars cheaper offering you just the watch rather than what they now call the bundle ah. and, and this is something that's super important don't look at the price of the watch on its own get the whole bundle like just get the whole thing and uh, uh, the data like the the thing that's sort of where I'm tripping up, it's like, how are they promoting watches? Not just Garmin, all of the companies are promoting watches that track from the, the wrist, but it's inaccurate. Like, they must have done a lot of testing. So, I'm actually interested to speak to anyone who has or does work or is involved in that industry and wants to come on the show about these devices. We, we speak a lot on James on Get Fit Radio is very keen on the Fitbit. Yeah. So, and, and, and that, that actually comes a lot from... 
I think the one that he uses comes comes from his wrist as well. So we're actually super keen to sort of learn a bit more. That'd be quite an interesting debate. Yeah, like exactly. And I cool. think some con- controlled testing. But like you say, I, you, you've seen it firsthand when you're doing a workout. You know, you take your you take your watch off. Uh, you stop the workout. Your watch says one thing. You put the belt on, and it's like a lot different. Yeah. So let's jump back to yeah. to that question there, mate. Two twenty minus your age is what? That would be 196. Right. So that's supposed to be your max heart rate, max which heart rate. beat per minute. Beats per so minute. So how many times is your heart beating each minute? Right. And you can you can easily measure that yourself as well. If you don't have the money for a heart rate monitor and the chest band and everything, you just put your thumb on your wrist, find the little heart rate point where you can feel something vibrating, and you just count... Uh, for 20 seconds, yep. how many beats, times, times it by three, three. etc. You have a pretty accurate... Let's just go through those things again, mate. So what we're, what we're saying is the number of beats is 196, in your case, per minute. Yeah. The way duk, to duk, measure duk, it... Duk, duk, duk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of duk, duk. The way to measure it manually, like you said, there's a point... And they say actually always you, pulse. Should, you should you should check yeah. yeah your pulse with your finger fingers because in your thumb you have an additional pulse so if you're trying to go ah. like this you could have conflicting where apparently in your fingers it's not either as prominent or it's not there some Such, of the geeks oh yeah. might might Interesting. call us out the other place is definitely through your throat here yeah. where where you could always big one it. yeah. <laughs> And what you'll have, there's a number of different ways you can do that. And it's not, again, it's not rocket science. You can go for six seconds, times, times it 10, by 10, yep. 10 seconds, times it by six, 15, times it by four, like any way to get up to a minute. The most accurate way to do it is actually to hold that pulse for a minute. Yeah. Like that's what it, that's actually what it should be. Yep. So, you know, and, and that's why we're getting a minute reading. So the comp, the comparisons is always beats per minute. Yeah. So we've got 196. What does that 196 mean, mate? That means I'm in the highest zone right. of working. So that's that's that maximum effort. Right. I, my body at this point is very close. To, well, it should be burned out. Like right. I can maybe work for 10 seconds or maybe 20 seconds. Or I mean, if I increase my, my lactate threshold, I might be able to even work harder in that end lactate threshold what's happening there so 196 beats per minute you basically body is filling up with yep. lactate yeah your body is just <laughs> fucked man. like at Brilliant. this stage this is like let's talk about the zones like yeah. we have five i think it's divided into five zones yeah let's go through them yeah. i know you did a quite an interesting instagram post not long ago on your instagram where you talked about the different zones Let's just walk through them. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing. Like, if you just, which I'm doing right now, heart rate zone calculator, you guys can do this. This is not rocket science. Like, it, it's available to you on the internet, and there's loads of different, there's loads of different, basically, uh, zones that, that you can go through. So, you're going to have these different zones. At the top end is what we basically call zone five which is the absolute all out. Some people will split the zone, zone five into different areas as well. I think, I think that's what you've got on, on what you've got there, Andre. So you've got zone five, A, B, and C. What does it say for that one, mate? Zone five, A would be lactate threshold, threshold and that's going to be hard pulls. You're going to be around 85 to 92% heart rate, right. which is anaerobically. Then we have s- s- set or zone 5B, yeah. which is very hard, so just right above. And then we have number C, which is an absolute all-out. So your all-out, it's, it's giving as a guide to basically, <coughs> on your chart, 95 to 100. On the chart I've got here, it's basically 90 to 100% of your max heart rate. Yeah. So what we're saying there is that at that level, you can only deliver at that level the same power that you're delivering or you can only continue for a very, very short period of time. Exactly. It's a sprint. (coughs) It's a sprint. And that's due to the fact that, as you mentioned there before, the metabolic system that you're using is anaerobic. Anaerobic means without oxygen. Yeah. And this is, I think this is the technical stuff that people really want. So we'll try and explain it in the easiest way as possible. You're only going to be able to continue to physically perform without oxygen for a very, 
very short period of time. That's yeah. why you're only able to perform in that zone five for a super short period of time. Can you train it? Because CrossFit is asking you to perform at or near that maximum. Like the, Essentially, mate, the better CrossFit athletes can perform for longer periods in that zone. Yeah. So how are you looking at training it? So in general, I think what I've learned throughout the past couple of years is that endurance training and CrossFit training, the development of the systems are actually quite similar. Absolutely. We want to develop the aerobic base, which is going to be working zone one and two, which we're going to go come back to. And then we're going to be, want to be working in the zone four and five. Yeah. So anaerobically. And we want to spend less time in those moderate heart zones, so yeah. zone three ish. We want to be working in zone three once we get close to competition because that's approximately where we're going to be in certain workouts. Right. But in order to develop, we need to develop zone one and two and zone four and five. And zone three in the middle will automatically improve. So we want right. to improve both sides of the spectrum in order to improve the middle thing. Right. Um, so in order to improve this zone five, a, a very similar example that I have in my training, and this is pretty much throughout my whole season, is that I'll have all-out sprints on the bike, three times 10 seconds. Then I'll take 70% of that, and I'll do 15-second sprints with a 60 seconds rest for about 15 to 20 rounds. Right. So I'll be working a little bit lower, but for a little bit longer, so it's still zone five yeah but it's not zone five c which is yeah. all out i did that in the beginning i could only last for 10 seconds because i gave it my absolute most right and my it's muscular fatigue before anything else right right um and so so that's quite an easy way to develop it it's max out on one of the cyclical machines yeah either road bike or ski max effort 10 seconds three rounds establish a peak one yeah or peak average yeah and then take 70% of that, go for 15 seconds with 60 to 90 seconds rest in between right. for about 15 to 20 rounds. And what we're looking at, you, you, you put in another factor there as well, mate, which is super important, is essentially if it's a bike or if it's a rower or a ski or even a run, we're also measuring how much A on the bike, how much power you're able to yeah. deliver to the bike. And then on a rowing machine, it, it you could use any one of the measures on there. Like you can use your time split per 500. Same on a run. Like how far can, how fast can you run? So yeah. you need to immediately start linking your heart rate to that pace. And in simple terms, what we're looking to do is if you're able to deliver four minutes a kilometer, that's putting you in the red, that's putting you in zone five, and you're able to hold it for 10 seconds. What we eventually want to get you to be able to do is hold it for 15 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds as well. Yep. And what that in turn will do, will it enable you to hold a, if we go back to running, a 415 per kilometer pace for also a longer period of time. Exactly. Which, again, this might be getting a little bit complicated, but this is exactly how it works. And it's also what, what you guys ask for. So, mate, we've hit zone five. So zone five is like that's in the ditch you're you're in hell you might have muscular fatigue you're without oxygen one thing as well you're also using up there in that zone to fuel that is your which is more zone four and upwards is you're, you're actually using carbohydrates so we're burning from our sugar stores yep. we also we know that carbohydrate only lasts a very short period of time and that's why actually we run out of that energy so crossfit is a glycolytic sport glycolytic sport exactly but what happens when you do those intervals you mentioned like 20 rounds if i asked you to do 21 or 22 we'd start to see a massive drop off because you're tapping into an energy system which has now been completely depleted yep then we go down the zones it's probably better to build up from from, from the bottom as well you mentioned there zone two mate which, if th this is actually a decent calculator as well that I've come across here. If you guys are interested to figure out what your predicted norms are, be careful. It's not set in stone, but it, it's, very, it's pretty much accurate. Go to fitdigits.com, and you can put in your max heart rate, which you will have tested. Generally, I like to test this across a, a longer period of time. So I'll test this with, normally with a running athlete over a 3K run. 
all in for 3K. Yeah. I don't find with 1K, it's a little bit short. 2K is a weird number. And 3K is just a, it, it's a great number. So I'll take their max heart rate, which will generally happen for some people, it happens right at the start, but it will it will sustain throughout that effort. So you take your max heart rate, you take your age, and then you take your resting pulse. If you're going to go along the lines of the resting pulse that we said, you'd want to take an average over about a week period yep. to see exactly what's going on. And hopefully not with too, like you'd also have a little bit better sleep. We can talk about what effects waking heart rate or resting heart rates later but you have a pretty normal week you chuck those three figures into this calculator submit it and it actually pumps out all of your information so what it's saying to you here is or what it's saying to me here is that zone two which is what you mentioned before which is the endurance zone aerobic for me is around 105 to around 122 beats mate talk to us a little bit about more about zone two so <clears throat> generally this is one another thing to test your max heart rate in crossfit what we usually use one, is yeah. either a 30 minute bike or 30 minute row i know for example opex they would yeah. use a 60 minute row really um so that's the measurements if you're in a cross world 30 minute max cal on a bike a good score would be around 500 calories <laughs> for guys and for girls not so sure on 30 minutes bike after how long is your heart rate at max? I, it's only going to hit max in the last few minutes, but it's right. going to stay in the zone five like for a long, long time. Like right. y- you're going to get up zone four, zone five very quickly, Within, like, and you'll stay minutes. there. Like I think my peak, at ma- my max heart rate so far I've ever tracked is 189. Right. And during that 30 minutes, my average would be like 180. Right. Right. Um, so, so it's quite close. First five minutes, it shoots up. So yeah. on a chart, it's like up, and then it's just pretty, Stabilizing, pretty stable. And then it might peak you push hard because yeah. you push hard for exactly. The last few That's actually brutal. Thirty minutes. And generally, um, if you don't have a heart rate monitor and you want to work in zone one or two, what I've seen people recommend, and what I also do recommend myself, is that you are at a pace where you can talk. Yeah. Uh, or you do nose breathing only. Right. This is another way to control yourself. Because right. essentially, I think a lot of the times we do zone one and two, and we really struggle to, to stay in it because it's yeah. so easy and it's, it's long easy. and it's boring. Yeah. So some of the ways to measure it, if you don't have a heart rate monitor, is to have a pace where you can have a full conversation yeah. or have a pace where you only do nose briefing. Right. Only breathe in and out through your nose. Because right. that's going to – I mean – you can only get so much oxygen yeah, in and out, yeah, so yeah, yeah. so that's quite a cool cool way to do it. Um, generally, the aerobic stuff, so one and two, needs to be something that's sustainable, repeatable, and paced. Right. It's long duration stuff. Yeah. Such as thirty minutes or even ninety minute pieces. Yeah. It has to be something that's quite simple. Typically in CrossFit, we look at cyclical stuff, so yeah. it's just running biking skiing rowing those yeah. kind of things especially because they're low impact and they're yeah. simple yeah we can't have you do a real big 90 minute interval w- with body weight snatches it's just not going to work anymore <laughs> um so yeah. we need to find simple stuff if you're bored of those kind of exercises you can even implement stuff like bear crawls or yeah. planks or uh, ring rows or light wall balls or yeah. step ups, walking lunges, simple stuff like that that keeps you from not getting into that muscular fatigue state, yeah. lactate threshold, but something where you can continuously move for those 30 to 90 minutes. Within that zone of 60 to 70% of your max heart rate. So take, if, you, if you're trying to figure this out now and you don't have time to go over and, 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 and use a chart, take 220 minus your age, and then take 60 to 70% of that. So if you're unable to do a walking lunge and stay within 60 to 70% of your max heart rate, you are no longer in zone two, and that is not a movement you should use. And that's why, as Andre, you said there, I would really recommend that people for zone two training are just using super straightforward movements. Generally, cardio machines. Yeah. Like, that's just the, the, the easiest or or just a run. Yeah. One of the things as well is we're, we're using oxygen. It's an aerobic movement. And at this point, for most people, zone two, 
for everyone should be zone two. You're actually using an energy source of fat. Yep. That's why actually as well, this zone is known as a fat burning zone. So you're burning fat, which is also why being in this zone and being in this zone for a long period is also another successful way to burn fat. Yeah. The point is, is, and this is where that has a small caveat, is that it does take a long time and it can sometimes, especially if it's something like running mainly would be one that I would stay away from for some people unless your goal is running and then we have to, we have to get you better in zone two running. But if you're a CrossFit athlete or if you're a CrossFit enthusiast and you want to get you want to build this and we'll talk in a second about the aerobic base just use something that is not causing a huge amount of skeletal damage so it's not just pounding over and over it's quite funny you said there because in in crossfit because the workouts are very short zone two stuff we're looking somewhere between 30 60 a maximum of 90 minutes zone two for endurance yeah, it's quite a bit longer uh, than that. Three hours plus. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it would be. I mean, if you look, if you look, let let's put it in a little bit of context. If you look at a marathon runner, the zone two runs that I dish out for those guys are about two hours. Yeah, um, and and it's, you know, this is and that, that's actually what I put in in my Instagram when I did that post is like people don't spend time in this zone because it's quite boring. Yeah, it's like you want me to run two hours at that it's like conversation pace like what am i doing but, like but know. mate it's it's only boring because people don't yet understand the importance of correct. it correct correct yeah we, we see this often in, in the crossfit classes if we have like you know strength day for example and people are like oh man i didn't get out of breath today i didn't feel smashed it's like it's not always about yeah getting this, into that you yeah actually you should only get into that a few times a week absolutely um, and this is the thing if you look at if you look at running obviously I'm, i've been running a lot recently like i'll do one zone two run a week which would have as i said there at least 90 minutes maybe two hours maybe two and a half hours in zone two if we want to spice it up another thing we do is just add like a tempo block for 20 minutes at the end so when you have run slowly for like two hours the last 20 minutes you jump back up to a marathon pace and it actually builds some super nice strength and talking about that that's super cool because i know in crossfit as well what my coach has had me do is when i've had a session that's been like zone two 60 to 90 minutes super long and in the pm session or in the next day i have to let's say max out and snatch yeah so what we do in the session followed by the zone two is that we do a session where we optimize tension. Right. So that could be through plyometrics or core stabilizing stuff in order for me to build up that tension for tomorrow yeah. when I have to max out and lift. Right. Because what spending a lot of time in zone one and two does yeah. is that it sort of doesn't loosen you up and makes you relax, but yeah. it doesn't fire you up yeah. like a sprint would do. Absolutely. Um, so mean- make sure if you're doing this long you know, 90-minute sessions, yeah. it'd be really good to couple it with a, either a session in the afternoon or the next day where you try to optimize tension. Yeah. And especially for CrossFit or even for running, plyometrics is a good way. Absolutely. The second session or another type of session that we use is, is what you said just before there, which is an all-in session. So it's sprints, essentially, interval stuff. Interval, it's not always a sprint. For some people, it will be, but for not for everyone. 200 meters, 400 meters, 600 meters, 800 up to 1,200 meters, where we use an interval-based training. We now go out of zone two, and we hop up to basically the start of zone five. The, your first two, like, <clears throat> let's take something like eight 800s. And if we did eight 800s at 3K or 5K pace, we're not going to be in zone five for the first two or three. Nope. But then, based on a, based on a quite a strict rest period, or even a floating rest of around 100 meters, which gives you about 40 seconds rest time, we would then come to it on about the third, fourth, fifth, and the eighth. You're like the top, top end of zone five. Yeah. So that's where you're getting your hard work, and I think that was a great point you made there as well. Like on, and let's take this on a weekly basis, so this really can map out for people. So Sunday morning, you do a zone two run. It's gentle. It's easy. We're able to add to it because we haven't 
done skeletal damage. We haven't done muscular damage. We haven't completely depleted glycogen stores. We're pretty relaxed. We've run for 90 minutes or two hours. We're then able to do a strength session on Sunday afternoon. And these are the days where you can actually do both. Yeah. It's a little bit different when we come into summer because we're seeing massive amounts of dehydration. And so sometimes we do feel a bit depleted in the afternoon if we don't manage the nutrition right. We then... Monday would generally be a little bit more of a, a strength day. Yep. Tuesday could then jump into an interval-based session, so you're absolutely in the red. Would you then go and do strength stuff in that same day? Probably not, because you've absolutely destroyed the muscles. And it's the same. If, you, and if we put this back to CrossFit, if you're doing like three or four brutal regional standard or open standard CrossFit workouts on Tuesday morning, you're not maxing out snatch on Tuesday afternoon, are you? Hell no. What sort of stuff are you doing on Tuesday afternoon? That would be just stuff to make you feel better for the next day, right. just to make you recover. That could be mu- movement work. If you have mobility restrictions that you might want to take care of, it can be, you know, if, if certain workouts in the morning is beating you up in a certain way, it could be, you know, you've done carrying 150 wall balls in the morning, your legs are absolutely destroyed. Yeah. I would maybe do a 30 minute bike, right. easy, easy pace, Super every cool. third just minute, just get up, do some movement work, or even just get a little bit of form rolling in, just yeah. to increase blood flow. Yeah. Basically, just getting some blood flow going. So that you can return back to baseline as quick as, as possible, quick as possible, so that we the next day can be back yeah. into normal. And then that next session, if, if we if we look through that week, and if you are running, and generally I think people that are are running are moving sort of like three to four times a week. Your third session and maybe your fourth session would be a, a lot of what I'd call more tempo stuff. So we'd we'd look at what you're racing towards and we'd get you race we'd get you running at that pace. Yeah. So we'd look at what you're sort of cycling towards and we'd get you cycling at that pace. So your body starts and this is one of the things why yes we can train you for a marathon. Yeah, we can't really train you for CrossFit in a short period of time, but the longer that we get, the more adaptation that we get. So if I can push you out there and your 10 K pace is going to be 445. I can adapt you in those sessions and getting you do longer intervals, two to three K intervals at that adapted pace with a short recovery. Again, you're going to, in the end, you're, you're actually going to be lower end of zone five. You're not, you're not really, it's not red line stuff. It's not completely yep. aerobic. So it's actually potentially just at, at the top of zone four. And I, I guess it's, it's very, well, it is very similar as well in CrossFit. So you've got and, and that would be a workout that would be more of an interval-based workout. So yep. you'd, you'd, you'd still be there, but you'd be like, you could almost do those sets for, for like if you were doing one minute on, two minutes off, you know, you'd come and you'd feel, okay, I can continue this for as long as you really want. I'm, there's going to be a point where I'm just going to run out of energy because I'm starting to dip into carbohydrate eventually. Yep. But you're still, you're conditioning yourself. The intensity in that minute is, is at, could be close to competition level but then you're getting some decent recovery as well yeah so that would come that would come later in the week now one of the things or it would come at some stage of the week and you can put this together i think sometimes and, and i think crossfit's the same mate, it, mate for, it sounds like the exact same were yeah. you talking about running right now yeah it's the exact same idea i have of crossfit programming yeah it you know there's a long workout there's a short workout there's a pace workout. There's just some strength stuff. Yeah. There's some tempo stuff. Yeah. It, it, it's extremely similar. And I think that's what, what we're realizing more and more. Yeah. I know from the endurance world, and I know this from you, I know this from Cameron Nickel and rowing, that they do this principle called 80-20. Yes. That 80% of the workouts are, are fairly easy. Yeah. Zone one, zone two, maybe. Yeah, some, somewhere around that. And then the rest, yeah. the rest 20%. It's up in the heart. Yeah. It's, it's maxing out. Yeah. And it's sort of the same what I've seen in the trend of CrossFit programming. We're stepping a bit away from, you know, hard, hard efforts every single day. Yes. And in incorporating a lot more, especially for neuro athletes, aerobic-based development a lot of time during the week. Yeah. Because it also gives us an opportunity to build movement quality. Yeah. Because you, you're working at these low heart rates, you have, an, you have an opportunity to do, you know, thrusters with an empty barbell with a specific breathing rhythm, trying yeah. to improve your mechanics. You can even do slow burpees, trying to improve 
the mechanics of the baby over the bar. Yeah. You know, all those small things. And it's just about t- tuning into those things, understanding that a real big base building doesn't just need to be sitting on a bike for 90 minutes. Right. It can be incorporating a lot of different things. It yeah. can be teaching your body how to breathe in a certain way during certain movements. It can be exploring new kind of techers in different movements such as let's say toaster bars yeah you can practice different types of toaster bars in this setup yeah um i think one one thing as well mate is that and 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 this is it's so true like if you constantly feel banged up from crossfit you're going about it the wrong way yeah it's the same in 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 running or endurance sport like if you constantly feel banged up you're, you're going about it the wrong way like today i feel really good uh, yesterday, yesterday I ran a little bit of tempo work, quite a bit of strength work in the afternoon. This morning, a lot of strength work. I feel good. I feel loose. I don't feel like I've got any problems. And, you know, it's, it's that. But so if, if you're the point why, why I share that is if you're feeling every day banged up, then the intensity that you're, if you're trying to get better at running, that you're running at <laughs> is wrong. Yep. The intensity that you're doing CrossFit at might be wrong. And what, what we're generally seeing, and, and in the last 10 minutes of this show, this is where I want to sort of get to with this, is we're seeing a lot of people from CrossFit trying to fit in like two or three runs a week, and all they end up doing is banging their body up even even worse. Yep. So, and, and, and a simple example of that is if you're going to come three times a week to the gym and you want to fit in two or three runs, you've got to put those runs in with the theory that we were just talking about, with the theory of, okay, one of them can be an all-in smash fest. One of them needs to be really just relaxed. And if you finish it, and, and this is one of the biggest things, if you finish it and you feel like, oh, that wasn't too hard, A, you've done it absolutely bang on. Like yeah. You've done it perfectly. And B, there's nothing stopping you, like like what you're huge on there, working on a, on a movement pattern later in that day. Now, that movement pattern for you might be some core work. It might just be some mobility work of that you can just do at your own home. It, it could be something as simple of as one minute plank, 30 seconds rest, one minute squat hold, 30 seconds rest, one minute of, of Kozak squats, 30 seconds rest. Yep. Do that for 20 minutes. Simple. And it's so, so simple. It doesn't, again, it's not overloading your, your body. It's not, you're going to feel super good the next day. And I think that's from, from, <laughs> from the people that have shared their heart rate data with me on that are trying to get better at running, to better their CrossFit, to better their life. That's what we're seeing, mate. We're seeing that they're just in, and this is where we really wanted to get to, the gray zone. So they're neither, it's neither easy nor hard. It's just like, meh. Yeah, you know. it's just semi-comfortable. They feel like they're getting better. They, f- they, f- they feel like they're pushing a bit, but not too much, so they can still leave feeling good. Yeah. And there is days and times for that. Right. But that's not where we're going to see the major adaptions. And, and, and I think that's what we have to go back to in the zone one and two and the zone four and five. Why are we training these zones? Well, we're training these zones to see certain physical adaptions that's going to make you be able to work harder when it matters. Yeah. That's yeah. why we do them. Exactly. And th- this is the thing as well. It's almost like, let's jump back into a CrossFit, and it's quite nice the way that we're able to p- sort of put this all together for you guys. I- if-, if there's a CrossFit workout that's a nine-minute AMRAP, and someone comes up to the board after the workout and says, today was easy, you didn't understand i would just call you a douchebag but i'll be a little bit more scientific about it you did not understand the stimulus the intended stimulus of that workout yeah that's supposed to be a nine minute sprint in zone five that's (coughs) bless you there we go (coughs) and another one that that's where we get it a little bit wrong so why and then we, we we have to reflect and go well why were you not able to elevate your heart rate that much? Well, because one of the movements was rope climbs. And to do a rope climb, I need to... Okay, so you're not good enough at rope climbs under extreme fatigue. Yeah. So we need to scale that movement down. You need to do a pull-up from the floor, a rope pull from the floor. And this is where... And I think it, it, it links back to a lot of the conversations that we've had on the show and that we also have with members of really understanding the zones that we have so a, a workout let, let's build a workout mate like uh, thrusters rope climb and maybe a 200 meter run yeah so on what would you 
in, if we say if we did three three rope climbs, nine thrusters, one hundred meter run, we if we gave you a weight of ninety five pounds, forty forty two kilos, and asked you to do that for nine minutes, that would you would be dead. Yeah, that would be all in. That would probably would that be could potentially in. be one of the hardest workouts I've ever done. Why is that, mate? You do the rope climbs, touch and go. All movements allows me to move at a maximal pace the whole time. And awesome. That, and, and, and that's the whole idea. So it sort of comes back to also it's the coach's responsibility, but it's also the client's or the athlete's responsibility to if there is a per- – they have to either figure out the purpose or the coach needs to tell them the intended pur- purpose of the workout yeah. and the stimulus, like you said. So – it, you know, it comes down to also us telling them, "Yeah, this is an all-out workout. Yeah, it's not like yesterday. Yesterday it was a forty-minute workout, and it's a different pace you're going to be working at. Yeah, today it's a short workout. Therefore, we're looking for you know a, a zone five effort. Yeah, we want you to be blasting yeah. out. And they might have said, "Oh, yesterday was pretty chill, but that was the purpose. Yeah, we're so looking for a real big development. But today we're looking for that." anaerobic stimulus so that yeah. you can develop that energy system as well yeah. the thing and this is one of the questions in nine minutes with three rope climbs nine thrusters a hundred meter run if the thruster bar is 40 kilos or 95 pounds you're always going to do those nine thrusters unbroken yeah there's never going to come a time where you can't i know you know you can do it in round one round two this is actually quite a good workout we should do it as a test workout <laughs> i reckon you'd get to about six rounds but I know that at any time in that workout, you can do nine thrusters unbroken. Me, I'm a little bit weaker in that movement. My squat's not as strong. I'm not as strong in, in that shoulder position. I'm, I'm using the white skull zone scaling for today, which is 25 kilos. Yep. I know I can do nine unbroken 25 kilo thrusters at any time in that workout. I know I can do them all the time, and I know I can go through and I can maintain that stimulus. If I start putting the weight up, I'm going to have to rest and I'm not going to get the same stimulus. So yeah. my heart rate, essentially what's happening when we're resting, we're just waiting for our heart rate to recover. So we're up, we're down. Whereas your, your heart rate's going to go up in the first round of the workout. Cause and hold on. <laughs> <laughs> but you're going to do your nine thrusters in 10 seconds in the first round, but you're going to do still nine thrusters unbroken in about 15 seconds yeah. by round three, four, and five. So we're really getting... We, we're really trying to create the same thing, but if we don't scale it properly, we're unable to create essentially what we're trying to create. Yeah. So one of the biggest takeaways, <laughs> if you want to build a freaking engine, yep. a real big capacity is step number one. It's the foundation yep. of the energy system. The other thing that we want to see is less time in that gray zone. So if every workout is challenging you but not ending your life, it's probably not the right one as well. So hopefully through that show, we've enabled you to understand a little bit and see actually how close endurance and CrossFit are. Why? Because it's moving the body, the human body at the same time as well. We're still dealing with the same vehicle for everyone to travel in. Yep. The fact that it's in CrossFit, that's why these things are so close. The final point I want to make, if you want to get better at running and you have two or three times a week... Spend one time in zone two, nice and steady, 60 to 70% conversation pace for at least an hour. The next one, you're going to go all in, some sort of intervals. You want to die. You want it to stop halfway through. It feels the same for me. It feels the same for everyone. And if you do have a third one, then you need to incorporate a little bit of tempo stuff. CrossFit, endurance, pretty similar. Very similar. That's been all about heart rate, mate. Awesome, as always, and hopefully that answers a lot of questions. Folks, if you do have questions, winning at innerfight.com, we would absolutely love to hear from you. Until next time, see you soon. Take care.